Okay, we're back now for the third lecture in the series in uh, Communication 1332. You know, last time we talked about um, our, our audience, we talked about listening, and then we talked about analyzing our audience and getting as much information as we could, and then the five steps to start speech preparation. Well, we're going to expand on those today. We just kind of brushed over them lightly, but we're going to look at some of those more specifically. Uh, by starting with chapter four, looking at informative speaking, because the first speech you're going to give in this class is informative, and you're going to give many informative speeches in your careers, uh, and also here at this university, probably in many of your courses. So, good place to start. Know that essentially, it, when we are speaking informatively, or our purpose is to inform, that we are acting as a teacher. What I'm doing right now is a form of informative presentation. I'm sharing information with you. I am ho hoping to teach you some of the things about communication concepts and about being an effective presenter. So that's the essence of informative speaking. There are four functions, uh, different, four different functions that informative speaking may serve. The first is to introduce new, and let, really look at that word, new. Introduce new ideas, introduce or share new skills. When I say that, you may be presenting a speech on a topic that has been covered in myriad ways before. But remember when we talked about critiquing speeches earlier and the standards for critiquing, and that would be critiquing your own speech or having your speech critiqued uh, likewise? We talked about bringing something fresh. So if you're covering a topic that's been covered before, if you're informing us about something that other speakers have spoken about, other uh, there were other sources of information besides what you're now presenting, you want to always add a fresh twist to it, bring something new to the party. A second function of informative speaking is to shape listeners' perceptions. In this way, and I can guarantee you this is an uh, exam question in this class, in this way, informative speaking serves a pre-persuasive function. Now, don't get this confused. Persuasion, whole different purpose in speaking. But you can, and most of the time in business, you'll be called upon to inform about something before you're asked to come back with a proposal. First, just tell us about it. First, educate us about it. Later on, then we'll talk about whether or not we should make a decision according to what you've told us. But that first opportunity, that informative opportunity, you can still build in information that's going to be very helpful for you, build it in a way that later on, if you choose to persuade or choose to present a proposal to management or your audience so they will consider and then decide in the way you'd like them to, then you would have been informing with the pre-persuasive function in mind. The third function of informative speaking is to set the agenda of public concern. What does that mean? What that means, so let me give you an example and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Years ago, Somewhere in some restaurant, probably, or in a ballpark, or you know, at um, inside a store, grocery store, somebody was standing in a line, sitting at a table, sitting on a bench, and said, mused, considered to themselves or to someone that was with them, you know, sitting here behind this guy who's smoking a cigarette can't be good for us, or sitting here next to the table, you know, we're eating and we got people blowing smoke right in our face. Somebody considered that at some point. And so what happened was, well, let's start looking at it. And studies you know, were created and, and opinions were drawn and conclusions were drawn from those studies. And so we ended up with, hey, it isn't good. It's, that, that's correct. It's not good to sit on a bench or a table or stand in a store, in a store line and be subjected to secondhand smoke. So the information, the informative presentations that were made in the public domain made in community centers, made in cities, made across the nation, help to set the agenda of public concern. By, by giving us information, we then change the way we live socially, change the way that our society works based on that. But it stops, if we're doing this, if we're just setting the agenda of public concern, initially all we wanted to know was, is it harmful? What to do about it was when we moved over into persuasion. So what do we do about it? But just to share the information that, yes, study after study has shown it's harmful, so we're going to base our then later persuasion on that, that is one of the functions of informative speaking. 
And then finally, informative speaking can reveal and clarify options. I'm going to use my smoking example again. Uh, smoking gun, as it were. I'm going to use that example again because we can we can react this way or we can institute this change or we might consider uh, living this way or invoking this or whatever it may be. But we can clarify those options without ever saying, therefore, we should choose to. Therefore, we need to do X. We can present X. We can present Y. We can present Z just for consideration, but not for a decision. Just to be informed about them, to find out about them, for that knowledge, that information to be shared. So while these functions, you can see, kind of hint toward a later persuasion, they are not persuasive when you're informing. Just you've got to be clear with your audience, we're just going to look at the information today. We're not going to make any decisions. We're not going to talk about what to do. We're just going to see what's available. So clarifying options. Know that informative speaking places a high demand on the speaker. S valuing your, your uh, by that I mean to say your audience is going to value whether and how much they learn from you. And so therefore valuing your speech based on did they learn anything, how much did they learn. So new information, new understanding of a topic, that is going to be what they're, remember back critical listeners? That's the judgments are made on that basis. The speaker must therefore have a thorough understanding of the subject. You do this in one of two ways. Either, hey, I know it, I've done it. You want to know about hang gliding? I know how to hang glide. You want to know about a parachuting? I know how to do that. I've done that. I know about it. I've experienced it. That is credible. But you also can be very qualified and have a thorough understanding of a subject when you simply, you know, I didn't know anything about this, but I've always wondered how that worked or always wondered what that was about or always wanted to know more about that. So I did my homework and I learned a lot of really great stuff and I'm here to share it with you. You're just as credible as the person who's done it for 20 years. Just as credible because you did your homework and you let your audience know, I am credible, I am competent because I, I researched this and I bring you what I found. When you select a topic for an informative speech and narrow down its focus, remember, narrow down the focus because you've got certain time constraints, time allotments, and also what's your audience interest level, how long can you maintain and hold that interest level. First, ask yourself, is my topic significant? Because, uh, quite frankly, there are, some, there are some speakers that get up to speak, and I'm going to talk to you about X. Oh, goody. So, you know, there, that would be a challenge for them to make that interesting for us. So a significant topic or an interesting topic, just kind of interchange those, that's the first question. Second, when you're choosing a topic and you're narrowing the focus, the next thing you want to do is, what do my listeners already know about this? Because you don't want to just say mo, say mo, say mo, say mo. You want to bring something fresh. What more do they need to know? The third question. What else is it I need to tell them so they are adequately informed? And then finally, do I understand my topic well enough so I can help others understand? If you get into an area, and trust me, I've, I've been teaching for a while, if there's something that I'm fuzzy about, you can bet before I get up to give a lecture, I'm going to go and, well, I need to read up on that a little bit. I'm not sure I'm going to be comfortable with that because you're going to see right through it if I'm not. You're going to see it. And then now you're hurting that credibility. Now your audience may be questioning your competence. So very important four questions to ask yourself when you're selecting and narrowing the, narrowing the focus of your topic. Okay, what types of informative speeches? Because you can give any of these, uh, probably without, with the exception of the last one for this class. First, a speech of description. Now, this is where you're describing an activity, an event, an object, a person, or a place. What, what you're doing is you're giving a clear picture of any of those things. But language, you can see if it's a speech of description, very important. We need to be able to visualize that place, visualize that activity, visualize that person or event, whatever that is. So language important in a speech of description. A second type of informative speech you may want to give is a speech of demonstration. Now this is very common. These are actually probably a little easier to do than, than the others, especially if you know what you're doing and you know your audience wants to learn how to do it. Very effective. And that is, it's a how-to. 
you're teaching how to do something. You're showing them how something works or how to do it, how to you're, even maybe to uh, uh, teach them a skill. So in this case, you're creating a visual guide for them. And you're going to need to build in that speech those things that will visually guide them through the process of how this works or how you do this. Presentation aids you can understand, visual aids, visual support become very important in a speech of demonstration. The third type you have to choose from uh, when you're speaking informatively is a speech of explanation. Now this is where it's kind of hard for your audience to wrap their brain around the concept that you're conveying or the kind of technical or abstract information that you're trying to give them. A speech of explanation is going to really be effective if you give a lot of examples. So it takes it out of that abstract into a more concrete kind of environment. Your audience can see it because you are comparing and contrasting to things that they are familiar with. And then finally, the last type of informative speech is a briefing. These are very common in the workplace, and it's where you, you know, mostly organizational settings, and it's where you, it's, you're giving a short informative presentation so the person that you are informing, that you're giving an informed presentation to, is up to speed, knows what's going on, is better equipped to now do X. Um, one example of that, you know, before I go to the examples, you want to be brief, you want to be confident. We don't want to be getting a briefing from someone go, I thought it might not have been. I don't. You want the information and you want that person to confidently convey that information to you so you can be confident in going based on what you now have learned. And then you want it to be organized, which lends itself to how brief it can be. Uh, to give you an example of that, Think a uh, nurse, a uh, nurse's um, station. So many nurses go off duty. New nurses come on duty. This is what happened with Mr. So and So during the night. Mrs. So and So had her meds at whatever. You know, so where the patients are in the course of their treatment, in the course of their stay uh, in that facility. Another, uh, my brother's a sergeant with HPD. He's relieved by another sergeant. Uh, on, and obviously needs to know what's, what cases are working, what are we doing, what's happened while, I, you know, while you were on duty and before I came on duty. Um, uh, one in particular, I've always thought, wondered about how this briefing went. Two women having a sword fight in the parking lot of the police station. That one had to be interesting. So briefings, letting the other people know, letting your audience know, letting your listener know what has gone on. Brief, concise, confident delivery and well organized and that, so that's the key to that. You also want to support it with facts and statistics. So I've given you kind of a little cheat sheet here on this slide. You'll want to refer to this on your VISTA website and go back and look at this is good for this time, type of speech. This is good for this type of speech. This is useful when you do this. So it will help you decide this is the kind of informative speech I want to give in this course. This is the kind of informative speech I need to give in order to get the, this message uh, adequately conveyed. When you are speaking, when you are informing, and I'll go on to persuading or whatever purpose uh, uh, your speech has, when you're doing that, it's really important to tap into what they call the sensory modalities. Oh, yeah, okay, $3.48 word again. What is it? How do we learn? How is it that we learn? And we've, and studies have shown over and over that we all learn different ways. Some of us, hearing it. Hearing it is the way that we get the message the best. Some of us, I want to read it. I want to see the letters and the words in black and white. So that helps me to learn it better. Some of us, visual. You got that visual support. I need that picture drawn for me. Or I need to see a, a mock-up of that. So your audience is comprised of all different types of learners. So what you want to do is, you want to tap into each of those. How do you do that? And I've skipped down on this slide, so kind of go with me. I'm, at the, I'm, I'm doing number two before the first one. So, but uh, you want to, if it is an oral learner, your verbal, your vocal effects, obviously you want to make those really a, as effective as they can be. If it is a print learner, you want to support what you're saying with textual graphics, say, with charts, anything like that that would help that. Print, uh, and it may provide handouts for your audience. And then if it's a, a visual learner, then you want to illustrate what you're saying with visual aids, with pictures, with models. Things that you, uh, the eye can quickly catch, you can uh, imagine that color is going to help also there. All of these things will help you to 
capitalize on how many audience members can I reach. And if you use all three of these, if you try to find ways to tap into all three of these, then you've maximized who all you've reached in the audience. The key is, jumping back to one, motivation. Motivating our audience. How do we do that? Well, what at first what does it mean? You give them a reason to listen to you. You know, okay, you got me. I'm here for five minutes. You've got the floor five minutes. You want to motivate them not to just accept it, but to welcome it, to stay connected with you, to relate to what you're saying, and you relate to what they're hearing, <clears throat> related in such a way that they will hear it, rather. So hold their attention through things like intensity, sometimes a pause, just like that will make what you're saying next more intense. Novelty, something fresh, something new. An activity, I talked earlier about, works for certain size audiences to have kind of that kind of participation. Contrasting things, repeating things, making it relevant is how you motivate an audience to listen to you. So keep these in mind because it maximizes your potential of how many audience members you can reach, how many audience, and that 48 hours later, how much they remember and what they remember of what you said. There are six designs, and oh, this is kind of a wordy slide here. There are six designs for informative speaking. Again, PowerPoints will be posted on your VISTA website. It's also in your text. So this, let's hit the high points of these. Remember earlier we looked at categorical, we looked at sequential, we looked at uh, ca uh, cause and effect. This is broken down just a little bit more uh, detailed. Spatial, think physical relationship. On this map, here's this country, here's this country. They are having a problem. These two countries are... So proximity, you are, you are organizing what you're saying around a physical relationship, how things uh, relate to each other, how things, uh, how close they are, how far apart they are. So spatial. Or it again, on, uh, if I'm going to you, teach you how to use a camera phone, this is on this part of the phone, this is on this part of the phone. So physical relationships. That is when you organize spatially. Speeches of description, very good. Uh, a very good choice for that. Not the only choice, but a good choice for that. Sequential. This is where you're moving people through steps. I've already talked about this in a process. The speech of demonstration, how to. Think sequential. This could work very well as your design you choose. If I were to give a speech on how to make the perfect chocolate pie, which my children say that I do, then I would choose probably a sequential organization scheme or sequential design. First, gather your ingredients. Second, make your crust. Third, work on the filling. Fourth, so you can see, and if you do any baking or cooking, you know that if you don't do that sequentially, you end up with kind of a mess. You don't end up with the, the dish you'd hope to present. Chronological is another choice that you have. Very similar sequential, but in this case kind of history, historical order. Speeches of explanation, this works very well for those. How something happened, how it, how it came to be, chronological would be a good choice. Categorical, I've already talked about that earlier, and that is where natural divisions, something just breaks down into natural divisions or categories. Comparative, that's another design you have as an option. In this case, the unfamiliar, the abstract, the technical, if, you know, bringing those things to mind or showing an audience member, hey, you know how this is, well, it's just like that. Or you know how this is, it's nothing like that. It's the exact opposite of that. If you can show those comparisons and contrast, your audience can get on board with highly technical or highly um, sophisticated information that you, that you need to convey. And then finally, causation, your last choice for an informative speech. This happened, and it caused this. This is being done, and this is the result of that. Or, here's what we've got, and because such and such did this, such and such preceded this, it created this. Caused it. Cause and effect. Again, these are, oh, well, first, it's good for speech of explanation, but, again, you don't go that next step. You don't say, therefore, we should. Leave that part off. You're just showing a relationship. This happened, and it caused this. This was caused by that. So those are the designs you have to choose from. When you know your topic, when you've narrowed it down, one of these designs is going to make sense to you. One of these designs is going to say, pop out and say, that's going to be the best effect. That's going to give that information, convey that information in the most efficient way, in the most dramatic way, in the most memorable way. So 
we've been looking at how you select a topic. Uh, I'm sorry, about uh, informative speaking. Now we want to look at how you decide what that topic is for your informative speech. So chapter five in your text, finding your topic. I've said this already. What makes for a good topic? How do you decide this is a topic that has merit? This is a topic that has value. Does it involve you? Does it interest you? Do, will it involve your audience? Will it interest your audience? Remember, we did that analysis, so you should be able to kind of second guess that pretty easily. And then, is it manageable for your speech occasion? Are you, are you going to be able to handle it in four to five minutes? The knowledge of it, the scope of it. Convey that. In this topic selection process, uh, and you know, this is, everybody kind of works a little bit differently, but here's a framework that your text offers you. You start with the identification phase. And this is where you just, you first, 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 always first, look at your audience analysis. Then, brainstorm. Uh, you review your personal interests. Just what, what intrigues me? What interests me? What do I care about? What would I want to hear a speech about? I'm the audience member. Is that interesting to me? What are my experiences? And then to maybe consult media. You know, uh, television program, news reports, uh, newspapers, periodicals, all those forms of media that, you know, that's interesting. I want to know more about that. I want to share more about that. Then you move to the exploration or examination phase. And in this phase, that's where you're really narrowing. That's where you're really focusing. And in this case, your text talks about mind mapping. It sounded kind of scatter approach to me, but I can see the merit of it. Where you just kind of go from the, here's the center and let it just tentacles kind of flow freely about here's my subject, so it just kind of, or, or here's what I'm interested in, or here's what I'm thinking about, and then let those, the ideas about that just flow freely and then see if something pops up. Something really grabs you. Another way to examine is where you do topic analysis. In this case, you answer good old reporter's questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And so in that way, you're able to start developing that topic, choosing that topic by answering those questions. And then, you, you know, but you can't spend forever doing this. So a lot of certain amount of time to brainstorm, to review your interests, a lot of certain amount of time to mind map or, or uh, analyze your topic, but at some point, make a decision and get to work. That leads you to the refinement or the third step in this, refinement or, or where you frame your thesis, your refinement stage. But we're, let's look at that in a moment. How do you frame a thesis? And th just the word thesis, I think every student just groans. Okay, you need to write your thesis statement. I'd rather eat dirt. But we need to master writing effective thesis statements because it captures, it's the central idea, it's the theme. And then once you write that thesis statement, everything you go, you create, everything you develop after that, you measure it against that and say, am I serving my thesis? A am I still on track? Am I taking my listener closer to the goal that I have for them that I set up with my thesis statement? So it's important to learn how to write a good one. So first, you would consider your general purpose. The first speech you'll give in here would be to inform. Later, you will give a persuasive speech. We won't do them in this course, but we're going to learn about them. At some point, though, you will no doubt give a ceremonial or commemorative speech. You know, a friend getting married, uh, you know, heaven forbid that's a eulogy, but at some point, most of us are asked to speak commemoratively or ceremonially. So first, you consider your purpose. This is how we're going to write this thesis statement. This is how we're going to frame it. Second, you develop your specific purpose. You remember back when I talked about my flags, the Republic of Texas? You remember what I had to say about uh, what interested me was that 10-year period? Well, I want to give a speech about that. One of the problems I note, first off, on my speech to an audience about the flags of the Republic of Texas is that there were 10 of them. I'm giving a four to five minute speech. I have a problem. The problem is I can't possibly cover 10 flags in four to five minutes. So I start looking at that and I, in the refining process, I determined that four of those 10 flags were made by women. One of them was made from a woman's wedding dress. Well, I think this is interesting. And now I have kind of a subtopic. 
I can give a four to five minute speech on four flags. So I develop my specific purpose for that speech the way your slide's going to show. And that is specific purpose to inform. Notice it isn't a complete sentence. It starts with an infinitive. To My specific purpose is, okay, here it is, to inform my audience about the four flags that tell the story of Texas' brief history as a republic. That is one way to write my specific purpose. There are others you can imagine. But to inform my audience about four flags, that really is essentially it. Which four flags? The ones that tell the story of the Texas Republic. Now, from that specific purpose, I go my next step and I craft my thesis statement. The central idea, everything I put in that speech is going to serve that thesis statement. It's going to move my listener further along in understanding what I'm saying in that thesis I'm going to be telling them about. So, here's a sample thesis statement. Today, I will inform you about the four flags that spurred Texas progression to independence. I even go on and say the Come and Take It, the Dodson Lone Star, the Troutman Goliad, and the San Jacinto. There's, if I'm not talking about the Come and Take It flag, if I'm not talking about the Sarah Dodson, if I'm not talking about the Troutman Goliad, and I'm not talking about the San Jacinto flag, chances are I don't need to be, I don't, that doesn't need to be included in my speech. So you see that by crafting a good thesis statement, Everything, you know, I can't be off talking about the Navy flag or over here talking about some other flag. I can't do that because I'm not satisfying the thesis that I created. Very helpful if you get this done right off the bat, then, every, then your speech is going to sew together so much easier. So that is what I have to say about topic selection. Now we're going to look at how you research that topic because just because you determine your main ideas, you've still got a lot more work to do to make an effective presentation. Researching. Most of us roll our eyes when we even hear the word. But you're in college and you're going to do a lot of it and many of you already have. You know it backwards and forwards. But let's have just a little quick review about researching and about how we determine what are good results from our research. How do we determine that? First, you want to always be acquiring responsible knowledge. Complete and current. Complete and current. The main issues concerning the latest developments about your topic. Second, you want correct information. And when we get over to Internet land, you'll understand why this one, I can't stress this enough. Correct information. Because there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of bad information out there. So looking for respected authorities. And we're going to have, judge, we're going to have a evaluation uh, criteria for you so you can know that you're getting good, current, correct information. And then connected. What does that mean? Local applications. What does that mean? What it means is, it doesn't mean that this is first hand, I mean, a first rule of media industry, first rule of the news industry. How does it connect locally? If it, if it doesn't have some tie to here, we aren't going to report it. We need to, when you hear news stories, uh, I'll give you an example. Years ago, the Statue of Liberty was uh, redone, resurfaced, refinished, re whatever that is, refabricated, we freshened. So the Statue of Liberty goes through this long two, three year process of being rebuilt, um, cleaned up. And they had a huge ceremony for uh, when, when all the work was completed and they revealed you know, the cleanup job on the statue. This ceremony took place obviously in New York Okay, it's New York, uh, what is that? Hudson, Hudson East, Hudson, Hudson River. So, took place in New York in the Hudson. And there were truly dignitaries from all over the world, you know, because France gave us the statue, yada, yada. So, it's kind of an international symbol. So, when the Chronicle reported that story, here was the headline. Tall ship Alyssa leads parade of the, of the ships in the harbor for the unveiling of the statue. Why did they report it that way? Because that's, that ship is de uh, docked in Galveston, Texas. This made it a Texas story. They made it a Texas story. If you were reading the Washington Post, that headline stated, 
local politicians and esteemed dignitaries attend statue unveiling. Okay, they tied it to Washington, politicians, all right? If you were reading the New York Times, look what's happening in our backyard. And talked about the Hudson River and, and the island of Manhattan and because that's where the statue sits. So you see, each one of those reporting agencies made this story a local story. So remember that when you're presenting. You want your information connected, that local application, special interest to your audience. Why do, does your specific audience care? All right, looking at research, so now we've been kind of how we evaluate, is this good information, is this misinformation, I need that correct, complete, current, connected information. Let's look at a four-pronged approach we can take to research. The first is, what do you already know? I, I know a good bit about making that cho perfect chocolate pie, I've been making them for 40 years. So I know about that, and my grandmother's knee, as it were. So I already know something about that, but what else do I need to know? What's at the library? Now, most of you grown, in fact, I'll even tell you, um, my brother was a student here, and when I first started working in development uh, for this university in 1994, I think it was, he asked me, oh, where, you know, oh, you're working at UH, where are you working? I said, in MD Anderson Library. He goes, where is that? I said, weren't you a student here for two years? Yeah, I never found the library. Don't, you know, don't be one of those people. The library, and, and, and let me say avail yourself, and I think I'll have this on a slide a little later. Avail yourself to the tour that the library offers. Saves a lot of time, and you start finding out a lot of good stuff there. A lot of good information for you. A lot, and, and you can find it quickly if you'll take that tour and not be a former student who says, I never got over there. They had one of those. So what's at the library? Make use of that. What's online? which, of course, there's computers at the library. You can kind of kill two birds there and look on the Internet. I'm not saying Internet is not a good source of information. I'm saying to recognize it's not the only source of information. And then finally, the fourth prong to our, our approach to research, or Fourth Avenue, is what do others know? Interviewing is an often overlooked source, often overlooked resource. So let's look at kind of the pros and cons of each of these. Your personal knowledge and experience adds a whole lot to the party. We like listening to a speaker that can give us first-hand information. I could give you a speech about you know, not really skydiving but parachuting. I did jump out of a plane. So I've done that. And if I were going to give an informative speech, I would bring my personal experience to that. But I certainly do not know enough about it that we'll just rest on our laurels right there. I do, I survived it, so I must know a little something, but it would be good to have other information. So know that even though your personal experience adds credibility, authenticity, creates interest, it also can be insufficient. Well, it is insufficient, I'll tell you that, it's not can be. So you need to expand that with other support, with other information, facts and statistics, testimony, those kinds of things. So that was our first prong to our research, our first avenue to take, and we know that we need to take more. Second is the library. What are the advantages? There are several. Broadens the perspective, your perspective. Broadens the perspective of what you're researching. Extends, corrects many times. Corrects is, think of that when you found information somewhere else, maybe that, uh, that wasn't so good. Remember what I think I know? Enriches your personal knowledge of something. So again, I, I've, uh, here's my tip I talked about earlier. Go over, take the time, take the, the research tour at the library, and learn about the resources that are available to you, and then use them. And it's going to take you half the time, if not a third of the time, without that tour, and you'll quickly put your hands on things that will make your speech a, a really interesting one and make it successful. All right, let's look at the Internet. Has some advantages, surely has some disadvantages. The first is you're going to get up-to-date information. I mean, Internet, you know, they, it changes as quick as uh, from the last time you booted up 10 minutes ago to now, there's new information on there. Fast fingertip searching. So, and you can do it in the comfort of your home if you have a, 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 an Internet connection, a, a, an ISP. Disadvantages, though, what are those? There are advocacy sites, and trust me, there's lo there are lots of them, and they are veiled pretty heavily where you can't necessarily tell. You think you're getting objective info, and then you realize that, oh, wait a minute. Whoever has this website, the information on there serves somebody's agenda. So 
Advocacy sites that unduly influence you or give subjective, not objective information. I'll give you, uh, say I was reading on the internet, just investigating, friend of, of mine maybe has a medical condition or family member, and I'm looking around, I want to learn about that, and I determine or I discover that, oh man, here's this drug you can take, and it's, it's perfect for that. And then I look down at the bottom of this web page, and I've been reading all about, I can't wait to tell aunt so-and-so that, you know, her bursitis will get better if she takes whatever. And I get down to the bottom of that page, and I see that, you know, Johnson Laboratories or Bristol or Glaxo Welcome or whomever, a major drug manufacturer, a huge drug conglomerate, it's their website, or it's a link to their website. So you have to kind of stop and go, mm, I need to read more. So advocacy sites that unduly influence us. Second downfall to internet searching or internet information is personal sites that lack authority. You know, somebody's blog out there, or you discover that it looks sharp. I mean, you know, there's some really talented web creators, web designers. But is this a personal site? Do they have anything to back that up? There are a lot of people out there with a lot of opinions. A lot of opinions. But are they good information for your speech? Are they good information to pass along? And then finally, it's very limiting if you only get your information from the Internet. Just like it's very limiting if you only get your news from television. It's very limiting if you only get your information from a newspaper. All of media works together to have you informed only if you avail yourself to more than one type. So exclusivity it does not serve you well. So you do want your own, your own personal experience and knowledge of something. You do want library references. You do want information that's available on the Internet, in media, different um, sources. And then finally, oh, oh, I skipped ahead. Before we leave Internet, let me tell you how you do evaluate to determine is this good. First, the authority of the Internet information that you're getting. You evaluate the credentials of the author and the sponsor of a particular website. Second, you test it for accuracy. You search for replication. Is this the only place that it says this? Or can I, are there other links, other websites where I can go and it says the same thing, says the same thing, says the same thing? Also, grammar and spelling errors are a tip off that probably, you know, probably some problems there. Uh, you know, like those emails that we get that say that somebody in another country we've never heard of, them or the country, wants to deposit $50 million into our bank account. Yeah, you, if you'd spelled maybe bank correctly, I might go with you. Objectivity, another test. So be aware of biases. Too good to be true. You are, again, the generation that's marketed to. You know these better than anybody. You've got to stop and consider, wait, if that really is that good, why, why do I know more about that, or why aren't more people doing that? So, too good to be true. So you want to test for uh, and, and uh, unbiased information. Currency, I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about how current is it. Determine the date of the information, the date the information was posted. And then finally, the breadth and depth. How much is this site covering? Is this just a tip of the iceberg? Is there more to know? So you want to use all of these standards, all of these measures to determine this is good internet info, you know, I need to look for more. I need to look further beyond here because the, I, it, this it just doesn't tell enough of the story. Okay, now moving to interviews or the last uh, prong of our research approach, research method. What are the advantages of interviewing? Well, it becomes another form of personal experience, personal uh, knowledge. So you've got somebody there and you're going to relate that information in your presentation. This adds credibility to your speech and to you because you've taken the time to align yourself with someone who's expert in the field or someone who has the experience to share. What are the problems? Well, your failure, you can be the problem, your failure to evaluate the information that your interviewee has shared. Uh, like all other information, you've got to assess, you've got to Determine, is this good? Is this good info? And also, if you conducted that interview before you had adequate knowledge in order to be a good judge of what was good info. In your textbook, and I've, I've included here on the slide, the, uh, uh, some steps to take for an effective interview process. First, it's done after your other research. 
So after the other research, at the library, your own knowledge, um, uh, and then the internet, and media, wherever your other sources are. Secondly, you prepare your questions, and your book talks about doing, um, uh, making up different types of questions, probing, mirror, verifiers, reinforcers, all of those are kind of exactly what you think they are by their name. So, but take a look at those and determine what questions you can frame for your interview that are going to be, or produce effective information or good information. Three, when you conduct the interview, just the manner in which you conduct it, be on time. Dress respectfully, and you want to do that through any time you're presenting. Yourself in an interview situation, yourself as a speaker. You want to dress respectfully. And then listen. Make sure that you go back to that first lecture that we had on listening and uh, apply those skills, apply those things that are going to make for getting the best information and understanding, comprehending, so you can then share it with your audience. And finally, record what you learn. There's nothing worse than saying, oh, I'll remember this, getting back, getting ready to put your speech together and realize, oh, what did he say about that? What did she tell me about that? So make sure you record it and get your quotes verbatim. What are the tips for doing your research? Don't do as I do, do as I say, start early. The earlier you start, the more time you're going to have to rehearse that speech. So the earlier you start your research, the earlier you're going to get that presentation tied together organized your formal outline written, allowing you enough time to rehearse so you're going to make that A that you want. So you're going to deliver the best speech that you can. So you're going to have the best communication opportunity with that audience, that one shot that you've got to communicate to get your message across. You want to record all your sources and there are worksheets in your toolbox and your electronic text that uh, it just give you those sheets to help you do that, just something you'll be able to take the library with you. Or as you're re recording, uh, I'm sorry, researching on the internet, you can make your notes. Make sure you get all those. There's nothing worse than getting ready to do your bibliography. You have this powerhouse quote or this powerhouse fact or the statistic you want to use. And where did I get that? Where did I get that information? Trust me, from someone who did their graduate research and got down to writing that thesis after six months of doing nothing else with my life but studying that topic, researching that topic, writing that paper, and I had one quote and did not know where it came from. And it took me hours and hours and hours and hours to go back and retrace my steps and find it. Take efficient notes for that very reason. Think about, while you're researching, think about your audience, Think about your purpose, your thesis, and your time constraints. Use all of that. Keep that in the forefront of your mind so you include what is going to be best effect and eliminate what's just extra what's just, and what may even be garbage. Remember that thesis, that central statement, is your information you found. Ooh, this is really cool. Oh, I want to tell them about this. Is it serving that thesis? If it's not, ditch it. And then include there I am again with the local applications. How does it relate to this specific audience sitting in front of you today? Oh my goodness, time for a break, but we're getting closer and closer to taking the stage. So next time on our fourth lecture, we're going to look at supporting your ideas, chapter seven. We're going to look at structuring your speech, that's chapter eight, and then outlining, chapter nine, which is going to be key tool for you to be successful in this course and successful as a communicator. Okay, thanks. <music>